here I am. How are you, everyone? It's I wish I could see all of you. We have a very exciting opportunity here. Uh, welcome again. This is Beyond the Page. In a few minutes, we will be joined by two fabulous co-authors, Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. They're co-authors of The Wife Between Us, An Anonymous Girl, You Are Not Alone, and their brand new novel, The Golden Couple. But before we get started, I want to explain this evening's event and how it will work. We're using Zoom webinar. So as our audience, we cannot see you or hear you, unfortunately, but we do want to hear from you. So this means you can ask questions during the course of the conversation by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put your questions in at any point in time uh, during the conversation this evening. We're gonna do our best and I will do my best to um, take as many questions as we can throughout the night. If you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab, and the most popular questions will rise to the top of the list. So to activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, select closed captioning at the button at the bottom of your screen, select the live transcript to transcription display options will pop up. So we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can select full transcript, a sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. Greer Hendricks is the co-author of many New York Times bestsellers, but pri prior to becoming a novelist, Greer Hendricks spent over two decades as an editor at Simon & Schuster. Hendricks obtained her master's degree in journalism from Columbia University, and her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Allure, and Publishers Weekly. She lives in Manhattan with her husband and two children. Sarah Pekinen is the internationally and USA Today best-selling author of eight solo novels, and of course, the co-author to many New York Times bestsellers. Pekinen is a former investigative journalist and award-winning feature writer and has published work in the Washington Post, USA Today, and many others. Pekinen is a mother of three and lives just outside Washington, D.C., Please welcome our very special guests, Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen. Hi, nice to see both of you. Hi, so happy you. to be here. So this is a really great opportunity for us. And I have a million questions, but unfortunately I have to share my time with a few other people who have questions, our audience. But I, I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, you know, People are fascinated by the idea of co-authors and co-writing, and you know, there's probably a lot of jokes you hear, you finish each other's sentences, things like that. But I, I have seen that it is not an arrangement where one writes one chapter and you sort of leapfrog, the one writes the next. You, you say you craft every line together. So, um, you know, it would really, I could describe what I've read. It would be more fun to hear it from you. I know you spend every once in a while, um, a few hours, 36 hours in a hotel every few months. So, you know, paint the picture for us. Is it, is it the same hotel? One of you comes with a suitcase full of pens and post-it notes. Is this a fluffy slippers and tea kind of scenario or is it scotch and high heels because you're inhabiting your characters <laughs> i feel like it's it's uh, the, the hotels it's a little bit of both i would say in some ways we are we're really we're wearing our um we visit each other wearing our sweatpants and our sweatshirts because Sarah and I both do our best thinking when we walk. So we'll, in between our plotting, we like to, you know, walk around our city. Um, but we do at the end of a, at the end of a long writing session, we do enjoy um, 
you know, going down to a hotel bar and, and maybe not having a scotch, but definitely having a glass of wine or two. So it's kind of a combination, not too glammed up though. I would say we're mostly in our uh, sweatpants, you know, and sneakers. Yeah, absolutely. Sarah, is there anything about the way you work together that you think people should know? I mean, you have a wall of post-its. I think you called it Homeland style. I guess that's a reference. Is that a reference to crime solving or is that a reference to the scene writing? So that's a reference to my preferred method of organization, which is disorganization. I love for things to be kind of all over the place, to be able to move things around and see strange patterns, whereas Greer is much more tidy. And so she'll go around straightening up all the edges, like how can you work under these conditions? This is horrifying. And that's when we get together in a hotel. And you know, we used to go back and forth. Or I would go to New York for a weekend or generally a couple of days during the week. Greer would come to see me in DC, but toward the end, we ended up meeting um, midway. So we met in Delaware a few times. We talked about Philly, but we like to mix it up. We didn't quite find the one hotel where everything worked perfectly. We kind of like to mix up different cities and locations. How did the, that start? I mean, you work off a of Google Doc, but how did you hit on the right formula for how you're going to do this? This was trial and error. Or you had a plan from the get-go? I think we would love to think we had a plan from the get-go, but when we decided to write together, it was very um, instinctual. And Sarah came to New York City and we did we wrote the first 15 pages of the wife between us sitting side by side at some in some seedy hotel. And we were exuberant, you know, it was like that newlywed feeling. We were so happy, we were thrilled with the pages. And then we realized, wait. Sarah's outside DC, I'm in New York, how are we gonna do this? And at the time, my daughter was um, 13 and she was like, hey mom, there's this you know, new technology called Google Docs and Google Hangouts. And so that we joke that Google really became the third partner in our collaboration. And so that's, that is primarily how we work, where we, we walk and talk and then we turn on our computers and, you know, as you know, now Google is, you know, everywhere. But at the time we really thought we were, we thought we'd stumbled upon this great new thing. So you have said that you share the same narrative instincts and approaches to storytelling. So can you, Sarah, maybe start with you? I know you say you, sometimes you joke you have one brain, but we're gonna kind of tease out that thread. Can you answer that? Um, what does that mean? What, what, what well, kind of instincts? Know, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when I wrote my solo novels, uh, Greer was my editor. And so I was writing in the genre of women's fiction, similar to you know Emily Giffen, Jennifer Weiner. That's primarily what Greer edited. So that's what we were both drawn to at the time. When Greer left Simon & Schuster and when we decided to write together, we both started talking about the kind of book we wanted to write. And then we began to pull books off of our shelves and, you know, um, sort of compare, like here's something, you know, that, that kind of speaks to me. And we had a lot of overlap, but it was not straight women's fiction. It was psychological thrillers. We were pulling out books like Gone Girl, um, you know, Girl on a Train, we were pulling out some nonfiction. And so that really told us that we were very much on the same wavelength in terms of what we wanted to write. Greer, is there anything you would add? Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was, you know, when Sarah and I worked together as an author editor team, we had a number of uncanny similarities. You know, we're both the same age, we're both terrible cooks. Um, we both had studied psychology and journalism. And so I guess it shouldn't have been surprising that we were pulling down very similar books. And in addition to them being um, thrillers, they, were, they all featured strong female protagonists. And that was also really important to us. So we knew we wanted to write something psychological and you know, it's gonna feature strong women, but relatable women, like women who've kind of found themselves in somewhat extraordinary circumstances. So, it, they're, they're suspenseful, the descriptions are, oh, this is taut and twist, twist, twist. And um, 
I want to know what you both were reading as children. I mean, yes. this is before, <laughs> before you got to the Daphne du Maurier or whatever it might have been. Yes. You know, what, what were you reading as kids? Sarah, what did you like? I mean, I loved Nancy Drew mysteries. I had them all. I was addicted to those. I loved other authors. Judy Bloom, of course, was a favorite. But maybe it was the Nancy Drews early on. I still remember I had this tree house in my backyard. And when there was a new Nancy Drew book out, you know, my, my parents didn't have a ton of money, but they would buy me the Nancy Drew book and I would go sit in the treehouse so happily. That was my most joyful time until I devoured the whole book. So, you know, Nancy Drew started it all for me. Rear? That's funny. Um, I was, it was Judy Bloom all the way and then graduated from there to all of those books that were like about women in distress. Like they'd have an eating disorder. They were alcoholic. They were addicted to pills. You know, it was all these like very troubled women. Uh, that's what I was spending my time reading. So you, uh, Sarah, you were, you had a very successful career. You had seven or eight books already as a solo author. What made you decide, I want to add another voice to my writing? You know, I had been a newspaper reporter and magazine writer for many years, and I had loved collaborating with other writers on big stories. As a features writer, I would often do that. You might spend, you know, three weeks on a story. And Greer and I got along so tremendously well. We, when I would go to New York, we would go out to dinner and we would talk for three, four hours. We, you know, shut down a couple of restaurants. We just, as Greer said, we had so much in common. We were such close friends. So when she told me she was leaving Simon and Schuster, I was a little bit heartbroken because either she was my editor or my friend. And she confided in me that she wanted to try to write a book. And then she said, you know, would you mind, like, if I have some ideas, if I bounce them off you, or if I, you know, get together some pages, would you mind just reading me, them and giving me your thoughts? And I said, well, why don't we just do a book together? Like, let's cut out the middleman. Let's just, you know, jump into this together. And it was a very gut-driven uh, question. You know, we joked that I proposed. But it felt yeah. so right in that moment. It was just like a let's hold hands and jump and try this whole new thing together. You find it more fun because, you know, a lot of authors describe writing as a, it's a very solitary thing. It's a very lonely process, depending on how you work. Is this more fun? Yeah, I mean, especially I would say one of the pieces that is so much fun is when Greer and I tour together which we haven't been able to do um, because of COVID. But when we go on tour, it's like we go to a new city, we go out for a run, we have lunch, we might work a little bit, we have dinner, have a glass or two of wine, go to our event. And, you know, that, and, and sharing like the moments, big and small and good and bad, all of that, like is just amplified with, uh, with Greer. I mean, it sounds I like know. a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, and I had never written, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd edited hundreds of books, I'd written a couple of articles, but I'd never written anything by myself. So when Sarah suggested this, you know, at first I was like, I should try to do this by myself. And there was like a stoic, stoicism, stoicism mm -hmm. to it. And then I was like, God, this is crazy. Like, here, you know, Sarah knows what she's doing. This would be like a masterclass in learning how to write a book. So, um, you know, Sarah is more instinctual and like, you know, like she was saying before with the post-it notes and seeing things, you know, kind of in the, this, you know, and I'm, I am a little more like, I don't want to say rigid, but I would say a little more like cautious. And um, so I slept on it for, you know, 12 hours. And then I was like, let's do it. And um, best decision I had ever made. I mean, well, maybe besides my husband, because <laughs> <laughs> better get that in there quick. I mean, yeah, I'm glad yeah. you qualified. He can't, glad he you can't hear me. He can't hear me. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was. It was just a great. It was a great decision. And you know, there was just the great thing about. Um, part, I mean, there's so many great things about having a partner, but. First of all, there's an accountability that, you know, we every morning, you know, would be 
up nine o'clock, starting to talk, starting our writing. You know, there was no, um, you know, there was no checking Instagram or doing your laundry because there's someone there waiting for you to work. And we would work, you know, all day. And the other great thing is that if you can't make a decision, like when you're trying to plot, you know, there's someone there to bounce every idea off of. And then we love to egg each other on. So we, you know, if one person came up with an idea, then the other person would be like, well, what if this? And then what if that? And you know, there was just, we'd be talking about just, you know, some, some like very twisty, dark things, but then we would just start laughing because we would just, it would just get very, it could get very absurd in a very fun way. So do you have, you know, it's the two of you and I'm, I'm guessing if you're writing sentences together, you may lose track of which sentence, you know, when you look back on a book, whose sentence is whose, you might not remember that, but do you ever ha need an outside arbiter for your as the two of you are trying to haggle over a thought or an idea, or this is in a partnership where it just gets done within the room or on the Google Doc, you don't have to bring anybody in to, to settle it. So we have a saying that yes. is, if it's not working for one of us, it's not working for both of us. Mm -hmm. So if we can't come to agreement about the way a scene should be or whatever it is, we have to keep working it until we're both satisfied. And Greer and I have both had times in different books where we're like, this isn't quite working for me. And the other one was like, well, you know, it's working for me, but let's figure out a, another way. And it always ends up being better um, as, as we talk more. And so when we, we don't go to like our editor and say, hey, you know, can you, you know, vote on this and sway it. It's like, that's all worked out, you know, in the room together. Right. That sounds like good words for a marriage counselor to potential yeah. to work things it's out. So, you know, when I look at the various covers that you have, they, they are very filmic to me. And, you know, both of you know that books are marketed in a very different way now. There's a trailer made for a book. It's almost like people often get to a book through a little movie, you know, as a book made into the movie. Um, how does that impact your process? Because things seem very filmic now. Are you thinking in terms of, are you, are you visualizing the way the cover might look? Are you envisioning the way this might be like a movie? Um, I mean, that's a big question. There's a, and there I'm going to break it down into a couple parts. In terms mm. of the cover, what was interesting with The Wife Between Us is we really had no idea how our publisher was going to address the issue, you know, without spoiling anything for anyone. There's some very big twists in it. And we just, we were so curious what they were, you know, how they were going to approach it. And normally, you know, when I was an editor, normally you send authors a few versions of a cover and you like all of them, you know, you're not gonna send them something you don't like. When we got the cover for The Wife Between Us, our editor said she had just one cover to show us. And it was the cover that is now on the book. Sarah and I both knew, in, you know, immediately it was the perfect cover. And it turns out our editor ha had actually drawn a sketch of that image to give to the art department. She's a genius editor. Um, and so that, I mean, it was, it's, that cover has now been ripped off by so many other publishers because it's really just so iconic and, and brilliant. And it did look like a movie poster. It really both, it, Sarah and I both re responded to it. That was very um, cinematic. I mean, in and then in terms of writing, to answer your other question, I would say Sarah and I are both very visual, um, thinkers and writers. So I wouldn't say that we're writing for um, for movies, but there probably is, there is a reason why all, you know, we've had a lot of, um, uh, Hollywood has been very attracted to our projects. Okay. Do you have a book uh, actually right now that is uh, being made into a movie? We have several in the process. And one that we can talk a little bit about is The Wife Between Us, which was optioned by Amblin, which is part of DreamWorks at Steven Spielberg's arm. And um, the craziest part was that, you know, the book was optioned before we had finished writing it. So we would send Amblin like act two and act three, and we didn't hear anything for a little while. 
And then they got in touch and said they wanted to meet with us. And so we were out on book tour and it was actually book tour for the walk between us. And when you tour, you only bring a carry-on bag because you're moving from city to city every day. And if your luggage is lost, you know, you're showing up in gym clothes. So you have your carry-on bag with a few rumpled dresses. You go to this big meeting at Amblin, actually in New York at a hotel with Amblin, with our crumpled tour dress that we've been wearing for like five days. <laughs> we walk in and the most lovely woman, Holly Berrio, uh, president of production, is sitting there. She ordered us high tea. And for about you know an hour and a half, it was just a conversation just to get to know you. And we kind of thought, you know, this is, this is amazing. They just want to get to know us. And then at the end of the conversation, she said, I'm having a bit of trouble finding the right screenwriter to, to take on the wife between us. And nobody is getting, getting it right. And so I wonder if you guys might be interested in the job. And so once wow. we picked our jaws up off the floor, we were like, uh, okay. So we um, had to create a pitch, which we actually Googled how to uh, pitch a screenplay which involves talking for about 20 minutes, painting a story, you know, opening it up, you know, the, the light creeps in through the, the slats and the blinds, you're, you're creating this image, this visual story, and we pitched it and then we got the job. So we've done two drafts of the screenplay and Amblin has renewed the option, COVID threw everything for a loop, but they're really committed to it and fingers crossed tight that we will see it on screen. That's pretty incredible. This is really, the story is a Hollywood story, your story. Yeah. It's really, it's really amazing. Sarah, your mic is a little bit low. Um, I don't know if you, if you can, yeah. So we're going to, we're going to work on that, but now we're going to turn to some questions and I want to remind the audience, keep uh, putting your questions in the Q and A and don't forget to upvote those questions you um, really want to hear. And um, we're gonna do our best to get to everybody's question. Let's start right in. So this uh, attendee says, hi Greer and Sarah, thanks for being here. I'm tuning in from Boston. Your books are quite unique and so twisty. Where do you draw the inspiration from for your plots and characters? And do you have a favorite mystery or thriller author that you recommend? So Greer, you wanna start? Sure. Um, you know, each of our books have come about um, in very different ways. I mean, the, the Wife Between Us was really about perception. And Sarah and I had both, you know, I don't know how many of you out there um, watch the TV show The Affair, but, you know, The Affair in, in, in the first um, episode, you have a scene where Noah, um, this you know male character sees this waitress Allison, and in his view, she's in this like short skirt and she's being really flirty. And then Allison, in her scene, um, she sees Noah and she's in like a modest dress and is just kind of friendly, right? So, and you know, fates and furies, you've husbands and wives. We've seen a million stories where um, you have you know two sisters' points of view. We wanted to turn that idea on its head, and so that was kind of like the the lightning bolt idea for that for that book. Anonymous Girl came about in a very different way. Um, and same with You Are Not Alone. So each each one, you know, you, we might get an idea, just like a little spark of an idea from a newspaper article or from um, a podcast. We both subscribe to Psychology Today. We're both curious, very curious about, you know, the human mind. So I would say that's probably the theme in all of our stories is, um, is kind of delving into what makes people make the decisions and think, you know, do the things that they do. Mm -hmm. Sarah, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I would just add that the golden couple started in a very different way. Um, mm -hmm. It began with the title. Our brilliant editor, Jen Enderlin at St. Martin's called us one day and said, I have got a title for you guys and I can't believe nobody has used it yet. The golden couple. And we were like, okay, game on. We got the title. Now we got to write a book around it. And so we began talking about, you know, the golden couple. What does that mean to us? And we thought, you know, it is that couple we all know. We all see them on Instagram. They are constantly having 
the perfect life. They are drinking champagne on their boat. Their kid is going to the best private school. Their outfits are, you know, always free of dog hair and, you know, whatever. So they're that, that couple. And then we thought, well, you know, we don't write those kinds of books. So we got to, you know, dig a little bit and find out where the cracks are, right? Where they're tarnished. So we started thinking about, well, who could investigate them? Who could get to know them as intimately as if they were, you know, reading their nightstand diaries or overhearing their private conversations? And so we thought, you know, it could be a family member who moves in to stay with them. It could be a neighbor. It could be a police detective or it could be a therapist. And as soon as we said that, we were like, bing dong, we love writing about therapists. We love writing about complicated marriages. And that was really the genesis for the golden couple. Well, our next question is from a very important attendee. This is Maya and she is currently in middle school. She writes with her friend and she's wondering how you never lose interest in a plot. She says, we always get to 50 pages and then we lose interest. Any tips? Greer, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think that it's really important when you're deciding what you want to write about that it is something that you can stick with for, you know, a long time, draft after draft. Um, so you have to find the characters and the plot and the setting that is that that you know that you really want to stay with. I mean, Sarah and I had an experience with our third book where we had an idea and we set it in a very isolated retreat. And we wrote 200 pages and we don't believe in writer's block. So we always say, you know, if, we're not, if we can't figure out what we're gonna write next, what's the next most interesting scene? And with this book, you know, kind of day after day, we, after page 200, we could not figure out what the next, next most interesting scene was. And so we did, we scrapped those 200 pages. We moved the book to New York city and all of a sudden it just unlocked everything. But that was a great example. We couldn't have spent one more minute in that isolated retreat. So, so Maya, that's why I say, just think really hard about the people you wanna spend time with, the setting, something that makes you curious that you wanna learn more about. Um, and it's not always gonna be fun and glamorous. Writing, is, writing can be hard too. Sarah, any tips you wanna throw in? I mean, I just want to say, Maya, I think it is so cool that you were in middle school and you and a friend are writing books and, you know, you're committed to this. Like, that's amazing. And, you know, I just want to give you a huge shout out and encouragement. You are a writer. You know, you are one of these people who knows early on what you want to do. Keep at it. You know, I began very young writing a lot of books. I would send them out to publishers when I was 9, 10, 11. And, um, you know, I, I'm finally getting to do what I always dreamed about. And I really believe you will too. And, and just, you know, hats off to you for doing it. Okay, our next uh, question is from Alicia Shea. And she says, please talk about your favorite uh, plot arcs. Your favorite plot arcs, Sarah? Favorite? Well, I mean, the ones that keep you guessing. I, you know, I love plots that have the twist, but I also love the ones that, that you feel in your heart and your gut, where the characters aren't all good and all bad, where you maybe view them through different lenses. You're like rooting for somebody and then you're suspicious of them and then you understand them and then they do something awful. So it's a plot that is constantly, it's like a, just a revolving you know, one of those things you write at the amusement park that's constantly switching it up. And I don't know if that is a technical kind of plot arc, but it is my favorite kind. Greg Breer? Oh, I mean, that's, I, uh, that is a very tricky question because I think some books you read in order to learn about a world that is completely unfamiliar to you and you love being transported, whether it's to a different you know, a different city, a different country, you know, a different, you know, socioeconomic universe, whatever it is. And then there's other books that you read and you're nodding your head because somehow the author seems to have like gone into your brain and figured out exactly what you are feeling and thinking. Um, again, probably not, not plot arcs, but those are just the kinds of books, you know, it just kind of depends on your, on your mood. 
I think both Sarah and I read a lot of different kind of books too. Like we both like nonfiction, we like fiction, we like memoirs, we like, you know, um, practical nonfiction. So it, it's, that's what's so great. There's so many options out there. Do you tend to read the same things or try to read the same things for any reason at the same time? Usually, usually not. I mean, we had, um, we, w when we were both stuck on that one book, we did read a different, a different book for, because it, it kind of, we felt had, might've had a similar issue to it. And so we did read that and kind of compare notes. Um, we often like the same books, but I wouldn't say we're like, have a reading list of books that we say you should, you know, I'm reading this, you should too. Okay, okay. Katie Starr has a question. I'd love to know if we'll get more stories featuring the inimitable Avery from The Golden Couple. She was such a fun main character. How do you write women who feel authentic, not perfect, and that readers still root for? Oh, thank you. Wow, that is a huge compliment because you know that's what we really strive to do is write relatable real characters you know none of us are perfect and we want to we want to show that with with our characters so the fact that that she did seem three-dimensional to you and you know Avery was such a fun character to write because she really played by nobody's rules she made her own rules and um and she was amazing for us to write and who knows fingers crossed that we will see her again um, Greer, let me ask you this. Does it take longer? Well, no, this is a question really for Sarah. Um, Sarah, does it take longer to co-author than it does to single author? Um, I would say generally, yes. Um, and that's partly because when you're writing or when I'm writing a solo book, my I can write whenever I want. And so you know, it could be 4 a.m., which is actually a great time for me. It's like 5 a.m. oddly is my golden hour, you know, for writing, or you can do it at night or on the weekend. When Greer and I are working together, we need to align our schedules a bit more. And because we're both, you know, we both have kids and we both have, you know, spouses and partners um, and dogs, as we've mentioned before, you see mine in the background, you know, we have a lot going on. So it takes more scheduling um, when we do it together. Thanks very much. Okay, now we're gonna continue our discussion with Greer and Sarah. And as a reminder, keep those questions coming, keep entering them in the Q&A. So our next question, uh, let me ask Greer, did you draw on your own life experiences as you're writing? In, in your opinion, what does write what you know mean? That's what a lot of writers hear, write what you know. So it's a kind of a double uh, question there. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I always joke when there's anything, if, if anyone that, you know, if anyone points a certain something and they're offended by it, I'm like, oh, well, Sarah came up with that idea, you know? <laughs> but no, I mean, our books are, are not based on people that we know. I think, especially when you do have a collaborator, things get so kind of, you know, um, revised and twisted that even if you did start off with like a certain idea in your head, you've, you, you've talked about it so much with someone else that it's 10 step removed. I mean, the thing that's probably the most, that's most familiar to me is New York City. For our first three books were all set in Manhattan. That's where I live. I've lived here for, for many, many years. Um, so are there certain things like, you know, when I imagine the preschool that we are writing about in The Wife Between Us, I imagine the preschool where my kids went. Sarah probably imagined the preschool where her children went, or there's like a boutique in um, um, in the Golden Couple. I imagined a boutique on Madison Avenue. I know Sarah has a store in DC where that she sort of that she envisioned. Um, so little little bits like that. Oh, except that we did set in the wife between us. We set um, a big scene at Spoglia, which is a real restaurant in New York City, and that's one of the restaurants that Sarah and I used to go to all the time and had our three, four hour long dinners. So does Sarah, does the write what you know, does that mean that you don't necessarily have to inhabit the world directly? Can you do research to write what you know? Do you think that works? I think the most important thing is to have the emotions be authentic. Much as an actress, you can't convincingly portray something that you don't feel. So 
you know, whatever it is, if you're feeling the angst, if you're feeling, you know, regret, sadness, you need to be feeling that as a writer. So you need to get to the headspace where you are so invested in your characters and you care about them as much as you would a best friend, that that all comes about and feels very organic. In terms of write what you know, I always say like, well, okay, but did anybody tell that to J.K. Rowling or, you know, because a few authors have done okay without, you know, without <laughs> doing that. Um, so I, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the things Greer and I have done in our books is really write relatable women and just get to know them so, so well. And, and everything comes from that. Okay. Alicia, just, say, oh, go ahead. I just have to think about which is just that even when Sarah and I are writing about characters that even are not the relatable women, but let's say, you know, it's a husband or a boyfriend or a woman who, you know, is causing strife. Like we really spend a lot of time thinking about our quote unquote, like, you know, the bad characters too, and what made them that way and what in their childhood. And we have to have some sort of um, empathy for them to understand how they became who they are. Because in our books, like nobody is all good and all bad. And in life, very few people are all good or all bad. Um, so that's something that's really, really important to us as well. So now we'll move on to the question from uh, Leisha Shea. She says, hi from Rhode Island. There have been recently some other jointly written books. It's a partial question I have here, but I'm going to guess um, she is asking about other jointly written books. Are you familiar with other co-authors? Um, have you been asked for insight from other co-authors? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of other co-authors. There's Liz Fenton and Lisa Sankey. You know, of course, James Patterson has made a career out of teaming up with everybody from Bill Clinton to Dolly Parton to, you know, whoever's next. So, um, you know, there, there are lots of others. And we're friends with a few co-author pairs, particularly, you know, Liz Constantine is um, a co-author, you know, female co-author sister group. So um, it's not terribly uncommon, um, but I think everybody finds their own way and everybody finds their own method in doing it with a co-author. And now, you know, there are some very famous peer pairings, Patterson, Clinton, Clinton, Penny, you know, all those sorts of things. Do you, do you look for those kinds of books, search them out? Are you curious about how that works or it's really so unrelated to, to your process? Is, it, is that of interest to you? Well, I actually edited um, Liz and Lisa when I was an editor. And I also edited um, Emma McLaughlin and Nicola Krauss who wrote The Nanny Diaries. I didn't edit The Nanny Diaries, but I edited some of their books after that. So I was familiar on the editorial side with working with co-authors. Um, and a lot of co-authors, they either alternate chapters or they're alternate characters. And Sarah and I, from the get-go, said we wanted to write, you know, everything together. So a lot of times, people who uh, will ask us, "Oh, you know, did you write Nelly? Did you write Vanessa? Did you write this? Did you write that?" But that's that was that's not uh, that was not our process. So Julie Hartunian says, "Does the same voice narrate all of your audiobooks?" I'm listening to the wife between us, and the voice actor is perfect. Oh, Julia Whalen is amazing. She's done um, several of our, our books, but we have not had the same narrator for every piece of work. Um, Julia, um, she is actually an author as well, and I'm reading her book now, and it's terrific. Um, but we've had everybody, you know, we, we've had Marin Ireland, um, you know, do our, our latest. We had the actor Kate Mara, who was in The Martian and House of Cards narrate an original short story we wrote for Audible. Um, Carissa, I hope I pronounced the name right, Carissa Vacker and Marin, Marin Ireland have done The Golden Couple and just did a beautiful job. Like people are raving, um, you know, about their narration and what they bring to that performance. So we, we've just been lucky. Like they send us some voices and uh, they say, we're thinking about, you know, this actress for the part, what do you guys think? And I don't think we've ever said, no, this one doesn't work for us. Like occasionally we said, you know, I prefer this one, but all the ones they've chosen have been our top choices. 
So are you getting samples of voices or they are actually yeah. reading your text as like audition tapes? We, we've had it both ways. We had for, for, I think it was our short story before Kate Mara did it, we had a couple um, samples of three different authors and that's when we picked. Um, but in the, the most recent ones they've just read, uh, read from the actual book. And like Sarah said, we just have been thrilled with the, the selection. So there wasn't any, we, there was no way we were gonna say no, we were just very happy. Is that actually part of your process um, to read aloud? I mean, even as a, as a reporter, I will sometimes, if it's not a TV or a radio script, even a digital piece, you read it out loud for the flow, for the feeling. Do you do that with your books? Absolutely. And more than that, like, honestly, it's, it's the weirdest thing, but like, I'll do this. And, and I think Greer probably does too, like walk around and start talking to the characters, you know, to myself, like muttering things. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do read aloud because you, you read things differently on a screen versus on the page versus hearing um, what you're, re you know, what you've written. So we, we do it in all different ways to try to pinpoint any weaknesses. Greer, do you find that with your writing, you know, sometimes if a story gets into your head, even a news story, this can happen. You wake up and you're thinking about it or you fall asleep and you're thinking about it. Is that, does, do your stories inhabit your brain at all hours? Oh, all hours. And Sarah and I will send each other, well, I stopped text. I, I had a habit of texting her at odd times, um, not realizing that she didn't silence her phone because of her children, but I stopped doing that. But I will email her and she will me at very strange times when we come up with, you know, when we're thinking of something and we, it's often a code, you know, we joke, it'd be like blue flower. And she'll be like, blue flower. Yes, that's exactly right. That will solve everything, you know, um, or I, um, I'm a runner. And so I think a, I get a lot of ideas while I'm, I'm running or walking. And so we'll, we'll constantly, you know, text each other or call each other, but yeah, inspiration comes at the strangest, you know, in the strangest moments. Sarah, do the characters inhabit your dreams? <laughs> You know, it's the craziest thing. I've actually had dreams where I walk into a scene and I'm looking around and I'm like, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is kind of how I pictured it and the characters talking and it's so surreal. And then I wake up and I'm like, what, what is real? You know, because when you're writing a scene and you're really deep into the scene, it's almost like going to see a movie in the daylight and you walk out and it's dark and you're completely disoriented. You kind of don't know where you are. That's what happens when you get into the writing. And so um, it, it is, I mean, it's such a cool thing. I absolutely love it, even though it's disorienting, even though my boyfriend calls himself a book widow because he'll be talking to me and I'm staring at him and he's like, you did not hear a word I just said. And I'm like, nope, I, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> but I, you know, had a great thought for the book. So. <laughs> so do you keep, do you keep a notepad next to your bed? Both of you, you wake up and uh, got to write it down. I have a notepad. Sadly, I really usually use my phone. I know you're not supposed to have electronic devices by the bed, but I also, I wake up a lot in the night and my favorite way to fall back to sleep is to listen to a podcast because I find I just don't get as anxious in the middle of the night if I can't sleep, if I'm listening with the sleep timer. So usually my phone is there and my handwriting is awful and it's dark. So it's just better to type it, even if I have a lot of typos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jul Judy Freeman asks, uh, she's curious about what you're reading now. Do you have a favorite author or authors? Sarah? Oh, I am actually reading now the new Sally Hepworth book. It's called The Younger Wife. And Sally is an Australian author. We have the same editor and publisher. She is terrific. And it's, you know, a very interesting story about a man who remarries. And his new bride is the same age, roughly, as his uh, adult daughter. And so Sally is actually coming uh, to the D.C. area next week, and we're going to do an event together. And so I've just finished her book. I highly recommend it. Where? I just finished a book called The Swimmers by Julie Osaki Osaka. 
it's a very slim book and it's almost like two books in one. Um, the first half of the book is about these recreational swimmers and their swimming pool has a crack in it and how they all are, are uh, affected by this. And then it switches. One of the swimmers is losing her memory and it becomes a mother daughter story. And I, I, it is so beautifully written. It's so powerful, but it is not for the faint of heart. I had such like anxiety reading this book that I, you just have to, it, it comes with a warning label, I would say, but just such a, so beautifully, beautifully written. Wow. And it sounds like a tough technique to accomplish what you just described. Yeah, um, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Julie Hartunian again asks, do you each decide to focus on or claim characters for yourselves when writing or do you share characters in the writing process? Now, I think since you're, you're both working on sentences together, um, maybe you, you have agreed beforehand, but uh, do, does, it, does that apply for the way you write? Do you do each sort of claim a character? No, I mean, that's common for other co-writers where one will take a character, the other will take the alternate voice and they'll, you know, each write from one point of view or they'll alternate chapters, but we've never done that. We've really discussed, you know, every chapter and every char character together so that um, there hasn't been that kind of divide and conquer. So Greer, Adrian asks, do you have a favorite book that you've written? Oh, I mean, I feel like that's like picking your favorite child. Um, I mean, my favorite at the moment is The Golden Couple because that's the one that we're, you know, that we've been talking about. Um, and the, the Avery character is just, she's so, um, she's such a maverick. You know, she lost her license. She's got this 10 session method for treating her clients that you, know, you have to kind of go all in and, um, she's just such a such a great character, and I have a soft spot for our other main character, Marissa. But all of them are really have really been special in 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 really different ways. Um, Barbara asks, when you are working with a company like Amblin, do they edit your writing? So they have not done an edit yet. What they have done, which was wonderful, is. They really, you know, I, I had heard all these stories and you guys have too, like about Hollywood, right? Like, and, and some negative stories. Our experience was the opposite. It was that the filmmakers in Hollywood that we spoke to were as sharp and demanding and, you know, as the top New York book editors, like they knew story, they were devoted to making great products. And so what they did, you know, for us, which felt amazing because if you had said yeah we're two women in our you know 50s who are going to break into Hollywood like that's not usually the, the you know the kind of the way the narrative goes they couldn't have been nicer and they're like you know we know you guys haven't done this before what do you need from us and we said we need scripts you know can you send us Gone Girl can you send us this they sent us all the scripts we talked through our pitch they gave us notes we sent in a draft they wrote back a very detailed and smart editorial letter and, you know, we went at it again. So it's really just been, you know, for us, it, it could not have been a better experience. And I would add to that, that across the board, across the board, we've had such great, even when we were first pitching the wife between us to other companies, we got the, the Hollywood people, they were so smart and insightful. And on each of our projects, the, the kind of take that they've had has just, has, um, I think was just real, has been really like surprising and affirming and um, yeah, we've loved everyone we've talked to. We hope we can work with many of them. Well, it sounds like, it sounds like you will. Um, Sarah, what would you say the most difficult aspect of being an author is? Oh gosh. I mean, I feel like, you know, I, I can't complain. It is truly a dream job. You know, I think maybe the difficult Part is knowing it can always be better and knowing when to let go because you can continually just shape and change and edit and tweak your manuscript and just knowing when it's time to let it go and move on to the next one it, it's hard it's hard to let go of these characters you've lived with for months and months and say goodbye to them 
but there's also like the great new set of characters that are always waiting in the wings. So it's, it's bittersweet. So Carol Griffin's question is, do you have an outline of the plot before you start writing? Or do you just start writing and see where the story goes? Greer? We, um, we spend months talking before we even start writing about each, about each book. We talk about the characters, we talk about scenes. Um, I wouldn't say we have an exact outline. I mean, maybe for The Wife Between Us, which we sold on a partial manuscript, we had written part one and then we had an outline for the rest of it, which um, for anyone who's read it will laugh because the third part was told entirely in letters, um, which was a horrible idea. Um, so I think we, we often have kind of like a destination that we know, you know, we want to, we usually know where we think we're going. Um, and we maybe think we kind of know how we're going to get there, but we end up, you know, end up taking kind of different, different roads along the way. Okay, now Sarah, Adrian wants to know, do you get input on the cast? Um, so they have let us know when different people are reading. You know, we've heard little things here and there. And then uh, one of our books, um, they let us know certain actresses that it was going out to. And they have asked us, like, are there any names you want to add to the list? Any dream names? And, you know, same with, you know, Kate Mara reading our original short story for Audible. Like, you know, that was a name that, you know, we were jumping up and down over. So, you know, they, they definitely want to know what we think. You know, do we have a veto or do we have a, you know, it has to be this person? Definitely not. But, um, <laughs> but they're very, like, it's, you know, I think Hollywood really respects writers. They, there's been a shift. There used to be kind of the joke about the writer in Hollywood, like never have any power. But now Hollywood really needs and wants stories. I mean, there's just this appetite. There are so many, you know, streamers and, and people are loving stories in all formats, whether it's a limited series or an ongoing or a two hour movie. And um, yeah, ho Hollywood, you know, is grateful uh, for the writers who are coming up with that material. Yeah, there is a huge demand for content on so many, so many levels. Greer, do you imagine now that you know that this is a possibility that your stories are going to be on the screen? Do you sort of in your leisure time imagine, oh, you know, this or see a movie and say, oh, she would make yeah. a great... Yeah. Yeah. W uh, yes. With some, with some characters more, with more than others. Um, I mean, anonymous girl, we had Sarah and I, the whole time we were writing one character and this was, this was, I think the only time we've done this, we actually envisioned a certain actress in that role from the, from the whole way through. We had like her visual uh, what really um, matched a certain actress, but otherwise we just write the characters as they are. And then sometimes imagine, Oh, wouldn't it be great if so-and-so was in that role or so-and-so. And the other thing we often do is when we're walking down the street together, we'll be like, that woman looks like Jess from an anonymous girl, or that woman looks like, you know, <laughs> Avery from the Golden Couple. We'll see. But we've been at reading, we've been at signings and people come up and we're like, you look like Nelly, you know, and they're like, oh my God. So, but yeah. It's fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. fun. Um, so we have uh, one viewer here who wants to hear a little more about your journey and your training and how you moved from one career to the next. So Greer, uh, we know you were in publishing. What can you give us a little sense of your, your background before that? Sure, sure. Um, I, right after college, I actually went to work in magazines. I worked at Allure magazine, and then I got my master's in journalism at Columbia. Um, realized that I would never wanted to be like a Lois Lane reporter type. I took a book writing and publishing class with a, my a wonderful man, Sam Friedman, who really became a mentor to me and realized I was meant to be in book publishing. I had always dreamed of being a writer, but I was scared and I needed to make you know, a living. And so for 20 years, I moved through the ranks at Simon & Schuster and worked with many, many wonderful authors. Um, most importantly, and especially Sarah, um, you know, who I worked with on on seven, you know, for seven on seven books. Um, and then one day I just realized I had to 
um, pursue my dream. And I wasn't gonna be able to figure that out behind the desk. And many years ago, I had taken out my 401k and given it to my husband so he could start his business. And he said, now it's your turn, quit your job and we'll figure it out. Um, and then luckily, <laughs> shortly thereafter, Sarah, I confessed my secret to Sarah and she said, we should write together. And here we are. <laughs> That's amazing. And Sarah, your story, you were a journalist. Um, what led up to you even getting to that, to, to become a journalist? You know, I always wanted to write. And so I, you know, studied journalism in college. And then I started just coming up through the newsroom, like the, the job, you know, the first job where I made, I think it was $300 a week with, you know, no health care, no frills, you know, if you took somebody out to lunch as a source, you paid for the lunch, it was one of those, you know, crazy places, but you got great experience. And did that for many years, I covered Capitol Hill, which I was horrible at, because I'm like, <laughs> you know, I wanted to, I wanted to write about, you know, people and conflict, well, there's definitely conflict, but it, it was, you know, I wanted kind of truth and honesty, and I was, um, you know, being spun a lot. But then I went to work for the Baltimore Sun and I began to write features and I loved it. I would do long narrative features. And that was really the bridge, I think, to writing fiction because I would tell stories that um, I would get a lot of space for that I would tell in the style that Trine Capote pioneered, which was, you know, narrative um, nonfiction. It would read like a short story. And then I had two kids within two years and suddenly it was like, I can't jump on a plane and go cover a story. I can't stay late to do something. I, I, I have to figure out how to balance this. And to, to complicate matters, I was living close to DC, but I was working at the Baltimore Sun. The commute was quite long. So I gave up writing and I quickly began to get a little bit depressed. I felt like I had lost my best friend. I... Uh, you know, I didn't know what to do. And one night I went up to my computer and I just began to type. And I'm like, I have to write something. And that eventually turned into the book, The Opposite of Me, my debut novel. And when my agent said, you know, what editors, I'm, I'm putting together a list, you know, what editors would you like to work with? I'm like, well, Greer Hendricks, you know, she edits so many of my favorite authors and I would love to work with her. And my editor submitted it, Greer and I met, we immediately clicked, and then I was writing a book a year. <laughs> so I have to ask, are there, what, what is it that you do to refuel, to recharge? You know, it's very hard to close the door on the ideas that are swimming around the brain and the voices and the inspiration. But what do you do to just step away from it all? and recharge. Greer? Well, I think you I think it's it's not really needing a recharge when you're writing. I don't feel like you need to step away. I think I mean in terms of um, what I like to do for fun. I mean, I like to run. I love television. I love, there's so much good TV now. I mean, I love to read. I play tennis, but I wouldn't say that it's something like that I need like a recharge from, from work, which I guess is really, a testament to how grateful I am that I get to do this. Absolutely. That's quite, quite, quite a testament to that. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I feel a little bit differently. When I'm writing, I have a lot of trouble reading or even watching, especially things in my genre. I tend to just, um, you know, I read less, I watch less on TV. But when I'm not writing, I fill up on story. I will just tear through books. You know, I'll read a, you know, a book a day. I will watch everything that I've been, you know, putting aside. And it's almost like, okay, I've depleted the story well. And now I need to fill it up again before going to write some more. Well, we could keep going with the questions. I have a million more I could ask. And it's been a lot of fun being with both of you and hearing your process, hearing the detail, and I can see why your books are so popular. And I think it's been a really great opportunity for us. So thank you very much, uh, Greer and Sarah. 
Greer Hendricks, Sarah Pekinen. Thank you thank so you. much for joining thank us. Thank you. Great. Thank questions. you. Thanks for having my dog, Lila, too. She enjoyed it very much. Uh, next time we do just Lila, we'll answer questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. So we are very excited to announce that next month's Beyond the Page is going to focus on poetry. So we're going to be replicating something similar to a poetry slam for National Poetry Month. You're going to hear from America's Got Talent winner, Brandon Leak, who's really amazing to listen to, award-winning poet known for her social activism, Sonia Sanchez, Boston's first youth poet laureate, Alondra Bobadilla, and Worcester's first youth poet laureate, Adael Mejia, and published Worc Worcester's poet laureate and public school teacher, Juan Matos. So that is quite a lineup. I'd like to thank you all for being with us very much. And that's, uh, that's it for our evening. And we hope you join the next event with us. Thank you so much. So keep your eye out for upcoming emails to register for events for this. As always, you can join the Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read through Greer and Sarah's work. There's a lot more there. Details are in the chat and in the event follow-up email that you'll receive. And we hope you had an amazing night and we can't wait to see you again next time next month. Thank you very much.